Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Kelly Beard, Content Specialist for Maryland Realtors, and I want to welcome you all to our Forms Update webinar. On October 1st, 2024, Maryland Realtors will be releasing new and revised forms to our members through our website and forms vendors. The majority of changes to our forms are made in response to new laws passed during the 2024 legislative session. Our CEO, Chuck Kasky and Associate Counsel, Taylor Kitzmiller, are going to dive into those new and updated forms in just a moment. This webinar will be recorded and shared. We do encourage your questions and we look forward to answering them. Please post all questions in the Q&A box below at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will answer your questions after each form is reviewed. And then we will have time at the end to answer any additional questions. With that, I will turn it over to Chuck and Taylor. Chuck, take it away. Thanks, Kelly. We are going to give everyone at least a couple of minutes to join. We have over 1,300 people registered. We have 400 and some in at na uh, as of now. <clears throat> Question is, how long is the webinar? We scheduled an hour, but they've been known to go long if there's a lot of questions. So just be prepared for that. We have about five, 425 people now, so we're still waiting for a few. So in the meantime, while we are waiting, let me um, again introduce myself. I'm Chuck Kasky, CEO of Maryland Realtors. I want to take a few seconds here. Uh, hopefully uh, people know Taylor Kitzmiller, our associate counsel. I'd like to take a minute to introduce our new director of legal affairs, Kim Link. Kim uh, recently joined us and uh, <clears throat> really will be taking over overseeing the legal department, including things like this. So this will be my final appearance at uh, <laughs> and the last time I'll have to talk about if you if you call that. Um, not that I didn't mind it, but uh, I will be turning over the uh, kind of stepped in in the absence of a director of legal affairs, but now that we have one, I'll be backing off a little bit to um, the great, I think uh, uh, a lot of people are happy to hear that actually. But so Kim, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself so people can uh, get used to hearing you and seeing you. Thanks, Chuck. Hi everyone, I'm Kim Link. I'm, as Chuck said, I'm new. Just started a few weeks ago. I'm very excited to be with Maryland Realtors as the legal director. Um, I look forward to working with all of you. I most recently have come from the um, Maryland Department of Health, where I was the senior advisor to the Secretary of Health and oversaw many boards and commissions. Um, and I've recently been in private practice, did a fair amount of commercial transactions, and including corporate and um, commercial and residential real estate. So I'm very excited to be here and look forward to meeting you all. Great. We still have, uh, it slowed down a little bit. We still have some people joining. So Taylor, why don't you get started? I think just tell us a little bit about the session before we launch into the specifics of the form. Kelly did mention that most of these were required by legislation passed in the 24 General Assembly session. So could you just give us a real quick overview and then we'll launch into the specifics um, now that it's the attendees have, it has slowed to a trickle. So we can actually sure. probably launch into the substance once you're done with that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so one of the main differences this year compared to last year that everybody will see is last year we had a lot of brand new forms, um, a lot of new addenda to our contract of sale. Thankfully this year, we only have one brand new form, uh, which will be the first form that we go over. And the rest are just revisions to existing forms that we have. Um, just something to note on our website um, right now is the forms that we will go over today, they are in their sample version. Uh, we also have our summary of changes and practice tips on our website as well. Um, <clears throat> the forms have been provided to all form vendors uh, and they will be published on October 1st, ready for use. Um, and they will be obviously made available on our website on October 1st as well. Um, Kelly, as she said, uh, we will be re 
recording this and we'll be publishing this to our YouTube page. Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, but roughly we get it up there a day or two after the webinar. That's um, correct. So that yep. sorry, go ahead, Kelly. That's correct. We'll usually get it the day, the tomorrow, Friday or Monday morning. Great. Um, and yeah, as Chuck said, almost all the changes that we'll go over today were made in response to laws that were passed during this last uh, legislative session, um, you know, requiring us to, to change our contracts um, and make them compliant <clears throat> with laws. Okay. Um, well, just let me just say, Taylor, yeah. real quick. Uh, I will only interject, you know, on certain issues uh, more, more broadly, uh, and, and this is one time because the point here is that except for the one or two, maybe two changes, these are not real policy questions. So we do suspect or expect, I should say, that there are some things coming uh, that you we may not be in love with. <laughs> and I would tell you that that is coming. We're not necessarily excited about some of these changes. Some of these new forms, some of these new disclosures, we're actually, frankly, not happy about. And we 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 opposed in front of the General Assembly. So just, just keep that in mind as you're formulating a question you might have, like, how did this happen? Or is this a good idea? Or whatever. Those questions are not relevant for today. Because, and, and I will try to answer them even ahead of time. Uh, but just keep your eye on the substance and, and the best practices for that we will give you on how to comply with these new requirements. I will edit, I will editorialize for you <laughs> and uh, especially on, on some of this disclosure stuff. So we will go through it, but just know that this is the law and all we're giving you is the law and how and best practices for compliance with the law. And so we're not going to argue about policy because the policy changes have already been made. Those policy decisions, I should say, have already been made, whether we like it or not. And so we're going to focus our attention for the most part on best practices to comply. But I, again, will also express my opinion if I think that it, I wish it would have gone differently or whatever, then I will, you know, I will chip it or I guess I should say I should butt in uh, at that time. Okay, so with that, Taylor, it's, uh, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Chuck. All right, let me share my screen. There we go. Okay, so this is our October 2024 Statewide Forms Manual of Changes and Practice Tips. Uh, gives a written explanation of all of the changes, uh, explaining why they were made. Uh, like I said, this is available on our website right now, so a great resource to um, look at if you have any lingering questions after today. The first form we're going to go over is the only brand new form. It is called National Priorities List, NPL, Superfund Site Disclosure Addendum. Uh, so why this new addendum was created, House Bill 486 um, re now requires sellers of property located within one mile of a NPL, National Priorities List Superfund site, to include an addendum to the contract that includes information on NPL Superfund sites, uh, which we'll pull up the addendum eventually and explain what a Superfund site is. Uh, buyers have the right to terminate the contract within five days after receiving the addendum. And the new addendum allows the seller to disclose the, uh, sorry, disclose the existence of a Superfund site that is located within one mile of their property and advises the buyer of their right to terminate the contract within five days after receiving that addendum. Okay. So it's a pretty straightforward addendum. Um, <clears throat> and the structure of the addendum was taken essentially directly from the statute, they provided uh, example language for us to use for the addendum. <clears throat> Paragraph one here, a Superfund site is a site of national priority among the known releases or threatened releases of hazardous substances, pollutants, or contaminants throughout the United States and its territories. 
<clears throat> so again, the seller only needs to provide this addendum if their property is located within one mile of a Superfund site. So it says here, seller hereby notifies buyer that the property is located within one mile of, and then they would disclose the name of that Superfund site. <clears throat> States here, information about the location of Superfund sites throughout the state of Maryland and across the United States can be found at the Environmental Protection Agency's Search for Superfund Sites Where You Live website. Um, and as we said, buyer hereby acknowledges that they have that five-day window after signing and dating the addendum um, that they have the option to terminate the contract by delivering a unilateral notice of termination under contract of sale to the seller. Okay. So Any let me let me let me ahead, just um, interject here. This is this is a bill we did not support. We didn't think was necessary. We worked hard to make it as narrow as possible. We have we deal with this almost every year. If you're familiar with our advocacy and you have seen the contract grow over the years, then you know if you're because you're paying attention that a lot of the additions, uh, the vast majority of additions to our contract are with disclosures required by the General Assembly. This is another example of a probably one or two bad transactions. Somebody bought a property, found out only later that it was close to a super fund, super fund site, called their delegate or senator, and then because they're big on constituent services, they put in a bill requiring that disclosure. Their intention, of course, is that nobody is surprised by this, this, this the status or the this example or, or the location of Superfund sites, even though it is widely available public information. And for the most part, located in areas that are historically known to contain hazardous materials. That's in this particular case, that is in fact what happened. This is the, if well, I'm not gonna disclose it, but suffice it to say that nobody's surprised that this particular facility has stored hazardous waste. It is very well known <laughs> um, in, in the state and probably around the country um, and even wider that, that there's hazardous materials at this particular site. Nevertheless, the bills come in and they're usually about uh, something like this. And we can have many, many examples of this. And then they want every transaction to have to comply with this disclosure that affects a very small percentage of the total number of transactions around the state. And so you know, we, we have consistently have this conversation with the General Assembly about the point of diminishing returns. You know, at what point are you disclosing, disclosing, disclosing until people's eyes glaze over and it's just too much information and they really haven't accomplished anything. So that's the first point. And we are consistently at least trying to make these narrow, as narrow as possible so that they only affect the transactions that they are really trying to target. So that's the first point. And, and we've done that. The second is our role in, in this transaction and, and, in, and specifically in this circumstance and really with any type of disclosure. We make it very clear, and Taylor, if you could pull up the legislation, you can see how we worked this. Yeah. Because we are very clear and we have been very consistent and I hope if you've ever heard me speak of this, this will not be a surprise to you because we established this years ago that our position on these types of disclosures is this. Realtors are not required, nor is it fair, nor are we capable of doing this work. We, it is not our responsibility 
on every property that we take a listing on to, to view this site and tell the seller whether their home is within a mile of a, of a Superfund site. We insist that when bills like this are drafted, it says, and you can see it right there in paragraph A, the seller shall provide the buyer with an addendum, not the realtor, not the real estate agent, not you, not the broker, the seller. And this is a hypercritical point. Please be aware that our position on these 100% consistent when the General Assembly says the seller shall disclose or provide this disclosure, it's the seller's responsibility, not ours. Our job is to be a source of resources. And you'll see it when we when when Taylor reviews the changes to the listing agreement. There is going to there is a new paragraph in the listing agreement, as you will see, that says, hey, seller, this is on you. And here's where you go to get this information. And if you find that you are within the mile via the website that we will provide to you, we will help you make that disclosure to the buyer, but we will not do the work for you. That is not our job. And we have been 100% consistent on this. So the, and, and the reason is if we undertake these types of investigations or research or whatever, then we are responsible for it and liable if it's wrong. So this is a 100% risk management issue for us. And it is 100% consistent with our position on every off-site condition that is a matter of public record. We are able to provide consumers with information and the resources they need to follow the law. This law does not apply to us, it applies to sellers. So please, please, please provide the seller with the website and revise them to investigate and determine whether their property is within the mile of the Superfund site. And if so, here's the addendum. And I can help you fill out the addendum. That's not a problem, but I'm not doing the work for you. The law requires you to do it. So this is this is hypercritical that everybody understands that. And that's been our 100% consistent position. So should agents upload the Superfund site addendum? No, that's what I just said, no. Our job, it's in the listing agreement. You can provide the seller with the website and have the seller do the work. And there's, thank you, Jessica, um, has provided a link in the questions. And so did Hamia, I guess, I hope I pronounced that. So yes, those are the great resources. That's what you should use. To provide those resources to the seller, the seller will let you know if the answer is yes, then you attach the addendum uh, or you basically what's so Taylor talk a little bit about how this is going to work. So I assume I have an offer or you know what is what is the workflow here. Um, if if do I wait for an offer, you know what I mean, and or do I get the offer and then I include the addendum and send it back is that a counter offer how's that. Work for right. Yeah. So I, I think it could go either way. I mean, if you do receive an offer and then you provide this addendum in response, and that's certainly going to be considered a counter offer because it's it's changing. It's not accepting identically what the offer was. Um, <clears throat> but I think sellers could certainly, you know, let buyers know um, of the existence that, yes, their property is located within a mile of the Superfund site. Um, before offers are submitted. Um, so yeah, it, it could go go either way, but just know that if you are responding to an offer with this by including this extra addendum, it's going to be considered a counter offer that the buyer has to you know sign and date that addendum. So here's a actually a very good question by anonymous <laughs> Mr. or Ms. attendee. Um, and I guess I misunderstood the original question. So suppose I take the listing, suppose the seller does what we hope they will do, get back to us and say, hey, yeah, I find out it actually is within a mile of a site. 
may I sign the addendum, upload it with the disclosures in the MLS, and then ask the buyer to incorporate it into the offer. Yeah, I, yeah, I sounds think that's okay good. to me too. Yeah, that seems I, like I, the I best practice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. I apologize that I misunderstood it at first. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's move forward here with our next form. Oh, actually, before we go. What if we find out later that the addendum was required, but not incorporated into the contract? That's the, the, the bill talks about that, doesn't it? Uh, let's see. Failure to disclose. Not seeing any information about failing to disclose. May avoid the contract of sale. It's just saying it has to be provided. So once again, when they write these bills and we don't, <laughs> they miss things. Um, this just says, if I get it, <laughs> what it should say and what we might have, uh, if they asked us for our help, we might have said, oh, but what if they don't even get it at all? Uh, I know, well, first of all, if you only later find out that, first of all, if it's before settlement and you can always amend the contract by adding that addendum. If it's mm -hmm. after closing, um, then I would think the buyer needs to talk to an attorney. <laughs> and then the other question is, oh, Taylor, you're typing the answer to that. Okay. Yeah, I got the I'll answer this one. Okay. So, Fernando, I hope that answered your question. I think it depends if you find out later, but before settlement, then the if the buyer, for example, finds out and the seller didn't tell them, then the buyer's agent needs to call the listing agent and say, oh, send off of that addendum. And then once you get the addendum, then the buyer has five days to rescind. So if it's before settlement, I think it's okay. Um, and then if it's after closing, yeah, I'm not going to even attempt to discuss that. I mean, that's clearly, um, that's a, that's a clear problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is in effect October 1st. Buddy. Yeah. Who is liable? You know, Nikki, uh, who is liable if it found out later? That's a question um, that we'll let the courts <laughs> decide. <laughs> but that, but but here again, and this is a very good question, actually, because what we, if you have done your due diligence and you can show the seller that it's in the listing agreement that they saw it, that you described it, that you told the seller what their responsibilities were, it is kind of your job to say, hey, did you do that? you know, um, but you, it's not your job to do it for them. I hope everybody understands that nuance there because ultimately the seller's response, it says the seller shall provide the buyer with this information. So what we want to do is make sure that we are not the ones liable. This is again, more risk management. Okay. Uh, just for time purposes, let's uh, move on to the next form because we're about 25 minutes in. <clears throat> okay. Actually, just one more. Just yep. I'm sorry. I know we have to, but Anonymous said, rule of thumb for the listing agent to check the site before listing, right? No. Hard no. This is not your responsibility. If you do that, you are now responsible for that. And you are responsible for ensuring the seller discloses. And if they don't, and you check the site and you knew it, and you also knew the seller was violating the law, you are now liable. That's my whole point of saying, please, please, please let the consumers know, but do not 
insert yourself into the process because you would be liable. Okay, and you have a general knowledge of the location of sites to know which sellers to notify um, or else make all sellers go through this process. Look, this is what the General Assembly decided. So, you know, Dean Martin, I love it. Is that your real name, Dean? Seriously. Um, that, that is what the General Assembly decided. And this is our frustration. So every seller, yeah, now has to check this website to see just in case they are. And we explain this to them and we explain how much they make us do and make sellers do. And again, as I started this conversation, where's the point of diminishing returns? So that's that's part of the problem. Okay. Um, so I guess these are somewhat uh, similar, but yeah, let's move on. And if we have it at the end, we'll 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 circle back. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the next, uh, the first revised form we have that we're going to go over, the residential contract of sale. Um, it is going to just be easier if I pull that up. So only a couple of revisions here. We've added that NPL Superfund site disclosure to the list of addenda. And we have added a brand new paragraph um, in response to, actually, let me here. In response to House Bill 11. So House Bill 11 now requires a contract of sale for property with a private or domestic water supply well to allow the buyer to test the water quality of the well. The buyer may waive their right to have the water quality of the well tested. Um, and this information has been added as that new paragraph, paragraph 29 um, to our contract of sale, <clears throat> which is right here. So notice concerning properties with private or domestic water supply well, um, and this is the statute here, contract for the sale of real property on which a private or domestic water supply well is located shall include a provision requiring as a condition of sale that the buyer ensure that water quality testing of the well be conducted. Settlement on the contract for the sale of real property may not occur until seller and buyer have each received and reviewed the results of the water quality testing. Um, so at the last part here, buyer may waive their right to have the water quality or the water, the well tested for water quality. So down here, the buyer has their option. If the buyer wants to waive, then they're gonna, you know, initial here that buyer waives the right to test the well. Or if there is a well on the property and the parties have to test it, then they're going to initial by water quality test addendum attached. <clears throat> Um, and before we take questions there, so that, that's all the changes to our residential contract of sale, but this change um, for the new water, the, the new well law has affected the water quality test addendum as well. And the reason why it was changed is previously our water quality test addendum stated right here, if test results are not satisfactory to the buyer, Buyer shall notify seller in writing within five days following, bu following buyer's receipt of the test results and shall provide seller a copy of the written test results. So before, only if the buyer was unsatisfied with the test results, did they have to provide the seller with the test results. However, the new law requires the buyer to provide the test results to the seller, whether they are happy with those results or not. So now we've added new language Within five days following buyer's receipt of the test results, buyer shall provide seller a copy of any written test results and notify seller in writing if buyer is not satisfied with those test results. The way this uh, addendum functions outside of that is exactly how it functioned before, um, before this change. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah, what is the difference between a private well and a domestic well? Chuck and I were talking about this earlier today. Let me pull up the statute real quick. Yeah, this is it. 
So the definition that the statute provides is honestly very not very helpful. <clears throat> so private well means a private or domestic water supply well that is a source of potable water. So using the word that they're trying to define as a part of the definition. So, you know, if the property has a well located on it and that well is a source of potable water, aka drinking water, then it's going to, the statute's going to apply to that property. Yeah, I would say, I would say if you, I mean, if before we started, I went to, I just searched domestic water supply, the U.S. Geological Survey <laughs> um, says domestic water use is used for indoor or outdoor household purposes. So I think it's kind of redundant. I think it's only because it's private, not public. So that was another question. So I think it's, they could have said residential, I guess, um, but it's, so it's not a public water system and it's used for household use. Brian said, it is curious to me that the water quality testing paragraph was added to the contract, but not as one of the contingencies in the release of deposit agreement. So the contingencies in the release of deposit um, procedure, the new, the new release of deposit procedure, um, you know, those were outlined in the statute. I believe there's 15 of them. So in order to add something like this uh, to that list, the statute itself would have to be amended, um, which, you know, I don't have the knowledge as, as to why it was or was not added to that list. But for your purposes, come October 1st, that is not one of the 15 um, contingencies under the new release of deposit procedure. <clears throat> Actually, Taylor, you and I also talked about this community well process. So I guess it doesn't just exclude them. So yeah, I'm guessing this would yeah. apply to a community well. I didn't think they were all that common, but apparently they are. Yeah, I, I think it would. Um, yeah. Okay. And actually, Yolanda Camp Campbell says the seller receives a, a test that causes the buyer to walk and the water report now considered material fact. I think the answer is yes. Taylor, correct me if yeah. you have a different uh, opinion. And I also see um, uh, somebody on the previous form about the um, Superfund sites asked a very similar question. I would equate both of these and and every type of situation like this to the same to the situation like what's in the contents of a home inspection report. If a home inspection report contains material facts and the buyer walks and you are now as the listing agent aware of them, should you disclose? Are you required by law to disclose them to future protect uh, prospective purchasers? The answer is a clear yes. I wanted to touch on the commercial properties yeah. and just double check. Okay. Um, yeah, so so as you can see here, as a, a contract for the sale of real property. Um, so this is this law is also going to apply to commercial property um, just as it applies to residential property. Well, for... So actually, uh, Brian has, uh, Brian Lipsky. So the water quality test paragraph, not one of the contingencies in the release of deposit agreement. Is it really a contingency though? I, I'm, I'm not sure how both of these disclosures fit into the release of deposit law. 
and the release of deposit agreement. What are your thoughts on that? I think he's getting at if the buyer terminates because of the results of the test, right. that he's saying that should be one of the contingencies that triggers the new release of deposit procedure. Yes. But like I said, that's an exhaustive list of contingencies. And the only way for that to be considered on that list, it would have to be added. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. So the General Assembly has to do that? Yeah, that's what that's but that I'm list thinking. of list of contingencies is in the statute. Right. Hmm. Yeah, we, we're not the ones who created that list. It was provided by the statute. Mm -hmm. So what was the answer? Does it apply to commercial or no? I so yes, said, it does. We does? Okay. Yeah. So community systems are not included. This is Mike Cerrito, because the homeowner has no control over them or their management. Hmm. We have to look into that. Yeah. I mean, as we can see, the, the statute really does, a, in our opinion, a poor job of defining, you know, what is considered a private or domestic well. So we'll have to look into that further. Yeah. Oh, what if the well test is under the home inspection contingency? Oh. Well, I, I believe we exclude uh, okay. we exclude that from the home <laughs> inspection. <laughs> nice try, Linda. <laughs> I was all uh, I was all ready to <laughs> loophole loophole. <laughs> um, okay, a couple more here. But somebody says, you know, anonymous once again, very busy. Um, would you please address all the questions? We can if we we will if we can, but we also are under time constraint, and we're more than halfway through already. So mm -hmm. we hope to, but we can't promise. I've seen a few questions um, asking to show the list of contingencies for okay. that release of deposit procedure. We will get to that um, when we get to the release of deposit um, okay. agreement. Uh, Barbara Best, does the Superfund site disclosure also apply to commercial properties? Actually, Barbara, if you we'll, we'll try to get to that question at the end. Let's focus on, let's not go backwards at this time. Moving on. Okay. All right. Let's let's move forward here, make sure we can get through everything. Okay, our next, so we, we touched on contract of sale, the water quality test addendum. Oh, perfect. Release of the deposit agreement. Um, so Senate Bill 651, which pa was passed in 2023, so not this last legislative session, changed the uh, release of deposit procedure when the buyer terminates the contract pursuant to a contingency. Under the new law, if a buyer terminates the contract pursuant to a contingency, as defined by the statute, so it has to be one of those 15 in the statute, <clears throat> they may provide a written notice to the seller and the holder of the deposit requesting full return of the deposit. If the seller wants to protest the release of the deposit, then the seller has to provide the holder of the deposit with a notarized written request for mediation relating to the release of the deposit within 10 days after they receive that buyer's initial request. If the seller does not protest the release of the deposit, um, or if they fail to provide the holder of the deposit with that notarized request for mediation within the 10 day window, the holder of the deposit shall, in other words, has to distribute the deposit to the buyer within 30 days after they receive that initial buyer's request. This explanation of the release of deposit procedure has been added to the release of deposit agreement, along with a list of the contingencies that trigger the new release of deposit procedure, which I will show right now. Okay, let me see if I can zoom here. Okay, 
So we have our release of deposit agreement. Uh, we've added in kind of just a, a disclaimer here. This release of deposit agreement does not serve as a termination of the contract of sale. The parties must execute either the unilateral notice of termination under contract of sale or the mutual release of obligation under contract of sale to terminate the contract of sale. Buyer and seller acknowledge and agree that the deposit shall be distributed in accordance with the deposit paragraph of the contract. And this is where we added in the new language. So notice if buyer terminates the contract of sale pursuant to a contingency listed herein and seller does not execute this release of deposit agreement, the following release of deposit procedure shall apply. So we have the list of those, I, I think it's 15 contingencies that are defined in the statute. And if the buyer is terminating pursuant to one of those, they're gonna check this box. So as an example, um, uh, your HOA review period, that, that falls under the one of, one of the contingencies um, right here, homeowner association notices. So if I, the buyer, terminate during my review period, then that's one of the contingencies. I can request the release of the deposit, all 100% back to me, and I'm gonna check this box. And in that scenario, this is the procedure that is going to apply, which I just explained. You know, the 10 day window, seller has to provide the written notice of mediation. Uh, that procedure is going to apply. And then we say down here at the end, though, if both parties do not execute this release of deposit agreement following a termination by buyer for a conting contingency not listed herein or a termination by seller, the escrow agent shall notify the parties of how escrow agent pl plans to distribute the deposit and the parties will have 30 days from the date the notice was delivered or mailed by the escrow agent to protest the, the, the distribution. So that's referencing the old release of deposit procedure. Um, and that applies when either the buyer terminates not for one of these 15 contingencies or the seller terminates. Okay, let's see if we have any questions. Taylor, hold on. Um, I mean, condo notice, yes, there's a question about condo. Yes, it's in there. Yeah. So question, title company has no discretionary uh, authority to decline releasing the EMD back to buyer. If reason chosen by buyer falls under the defined contingencies because the title company imposes their own judgment as to whether or not buyer terminated correctly, especially if title company never receives a notarized protest. <clears throat> title company. Right. So, yeah, yeah, the statute is very clear and lays out, you know, the procedure. And, and Chuck, if you if you know anything besides this, then let me know. But I'm pretty sure the statute says that the title company, whoever's holding it, has to follow the procedure. So mm -hmm. if the buyer does terminate for one of the contingencies and they note it in here, then that 10 day clock starts. And if the seller fails to provide that request for mediation within the 10 days, the statute say, states the holder of the escrow, that title company shall return the deposit to the buyer. Uh, financing contingency is not mentioned. Do we know why? So um, you're, you're correct. And that's one of the main contingencies that people are, are they bring up that why is it not listed? I was not involved in the drafting of this bill or, you know, how it came to be. So I can't tell you exactly why it wasn't listed. My hunch is that sometimes terminating because of financing can be a gray area. Um, uh, maybe the buyer didn't diligently pursue financing like they're supposed to. Maybe the buyer went out and bought a $200,000 cyber truck and now they're unable to get financing. So sometimes it can be the buyer's fault, 
versus something like um, terminating during your HOA review period, the HOA statute specifically says the buyer has that right. And if they terminate during the window, they get their deposit back. Can you scroll down a little bit from on this form? Yes. Okay. Can you go back up to the top again? I'm sorry. Yep. There was a question about mediation. I thought there was also an issue about if they filed a lawsuit. Am I mistaken about that? Question about mediation. Does oh, the seller um, also have the option of filing a lawsuit? So under the statute, they do. Um, however, because our contract requires the parties to go to mediation before going to court. That is why we've, we've stated that their option is to go to mediation. Now, if they, if they go to mediation and, you know, it's unsuccessful, then they always have the option of going to court as well. Where does Superfund sites fall into those contingencies? So I don't believe it does. I can take a double check. Um, no. No, it does not fall under the list of contingencies. So if somebody terminates pursuant to um, pursuant to the Superfund disclosure, um, then the old release of deposit procedure would apply. This is an error. Uh... Yeah, is, is this a form that you expect the party terminating to sign and circulate or would this be the escrow agent's form to circulate? No, this is the parties. This is the parties agreeing to how they want to disperse the deposit. When the seller... When, I think this is meant to say, when does the seller 10 days to provide a protest start counting? So the seller has 10 days from when they receive the written request from the buyer, where the buyer is saying, I want my deposit returned to me. That's when the 10 day clock starts. Okay. Let's uh, move forward here. <clears throat> okay. Changes to our exclusive right to sell. Um, pretty straightforward. So I'm just going to pull it up. We've already talked about the law changes that caused changes to our exclusive right to sell residential brokerage agreement. So we only have two changes here. Brand new paragraph 30 and 31. 30 relates to that well testing law. If the property has a private or domestic well on the located on the property, the seller um, and buyer must test for the water quality. So here we you know, explain that law to the seller and seller hereby represents to broker upon which representation broker is entitled to rely that there is a private or domestic water supply well located on the property, or there is not a private or domestic water supply well located on the property. And it's the same for the Superfund. We explain what the Superfund law is, and the seller is going to state whether the property is located within one mile of a Superfund site or not. And yeah, the super fun site disclosure. So if your seller says, yes, it is located within one mile, then your seller can execute that super fun site uh, disclosure addendum. Okay. 
Okay. Not seeing any questions about the listing agreement. Um, Kelly, can you post the manual of changes and practice tips to the chat? And sure can. Can I use this updated agreement today, even though it doesn't take effect until October? Uh, no, you can't, um, because this is just a sample version. They will be officially published on October 1st. Now, you know, this these changes, unlike the settlement changes or a change required by law, these two additions to the listing agreement are not required, uh, um, required by law. So if you're using, um, if you signed a listing agreement yesterday and you continue to use it after October 1st, you're not gonna be violating, violating Maryland law by not having this in there. It would just be recommended that you either add an addendum to your listing agreement with this information or have your seller sign um, this updated listing agreement. So there's a there's a, a question here. If the buyer has not delivered the EMD, well, this says to title company or the or the broker holding the deposit prior to inspections and after inspection determines to void how is EMD released it was never received well that begs a or well I hate that it that that raises a question about how it was even gone that far if the contract as you all know requires the buyer to deliver the deposit within a certain time after the uh contract acceptance date of contract acceptance if the buyer has not delivered the deposit in accordance with the contract, the buyer's in material breach of the contract. And the, the listing agent needs to address that fact that the parties are basically, that contract is voidable and the seller can declare the contract null and void. So that's, that's a question that raises way more questions and it's hard to answer. Obviously it can't be released if it's never been received, but that's, you have a bigger problem. All right. There's a question here about the GCAR listing agreement, and the answer is we have we don't know. You yes. have to contact GCAR for that. Right. Okay. Uh, the next change is to all of our uh, condo documents. So resale notice, um, resale disclosure certificate, all of our condo documents uh, have been slightly changed in response to House Bill 143, which requires a unit owner to provide a statement no later than 15 days prior to closing on their knowledge of the presence of asbestos in the unit and whether abatement has been performed during the occupancy of the owner. Uh, the condo documents have been updated with the new statutory language that requires the disclosure of any knowledge of asbestos in the unit and whether abatement has been performed. So these changes, like Chuck said at the beginning, this is an example of a change that we had to make to our forms and we don't have any discretion on the language. It's taken directly from the statute. Um, I'm not gonna show all four condo forms because the changes are substantially almost the same. Uh, but here's an example from the condo resale notice, um, a certificate from the council of unit owners, which includes a statement as to whether the council unit owners has actual knowledge of any violation of the health or building codes with respect to the unit, the limited common elements assigned to the unit, or any other portion of the condominium, and this is the new language, including any violation of the health or building codes related to asbestos. So just adding that uh, now um, um, additional information that if they have any information related to asbestos, that also has to be included um, with the disclosures.
So 11.59 p.m. counts as day one of the 10-day time frame. So our contract of sale says the first day, uh, you start counting the, the day following that the action happened. So it's really 12.01 a.m. of the second day. Yep. <laughs> also, um, if there's no knowledge, people want to say if there's a, a public a public personal representative or a state sale of some kind, um, there is no exemptions here for that. The only exemptions that you guys are familiar with are in the disclosure disclaimer form. There are no disclosure, there are no, excuse me, exemptions in any of these laws for estate sales or personal representative sales or anything else. So, or for that matter, even new construction, there are no exemptions here. So they could have put those exemptions in there if they wanted to, and they chose not to. So. Yeah. Is asbestos treated the same as lead in which the seller has the option to say no knowledge? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I believe it's in the other condo documents where they specifically ask the um, seller if they have personal knowledge that asbestos was in the in the unit or if any abatement was done to the asbestos when they were um, living in the unit. So if the if they have no knowledge and then then yes, if they they would just have to answer honestly and say yes, I have no knowledge. <clears throat> Will you be addressing the statewide renters' rights and stabilization act through association forms in the future? So, um, I believe that's really referencing the new um, tenants' first right of refusal law that's statewide. The Department of Housing and Community Development is in charge of creating those forms. As of right now, um, at least the last time I checked, they have not published those forms for use. They have told us that. They will hopefully be publishing them very shortly. We will send out a notice. Actually, um, we will be sending out a email, I believe sometime next week, uh, which kind of summarizes some of the changes in the law. In that email, we will include a link uh, that you can follow and sign up and you will be notified if you do that, you will be notified when those forms are officially published for use. So, so there's a long question about Superfund site and disclosing it. If someone is one mile from, I guess, the, the Superfund site, but another person is 1.1 miles away from the Superfund site, then they do not have to disclose. The answer is yes, they don't have to disclose. It says if you're within one mile, you have to disclose. Yeah, so you draw a line and people are on one side of it or the other, no matter, and anytime you draw a line, that's what happens. I didn't hear, have the condo associations been made, made aware they are to include the asbestos knowledge statement? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. They have a very good lobbyist. And we assume, I say that, they have every ability to have been notified of it because they have a trade association and a very good lobbyist. So we are going to go and assume that they have made that uh, their members aware of it. I will say um, the Department of Housing and Community Development has published the draft forms for the implementation of the uh, tenants opportunity to purchase. They are, there's a uh, notice um, that the, will be made available to landlords. Um, there's a counter offer form. 
And there is a, the last form is a notice of intent to sell and tenant's right of first refusal, which only has impact if the landlord did not make the offer uh, or did not solicit the offer prior to putting the property on the market. So those forms are in draft regulations uh, submitted by the department on uh, uh, notice of proposed action and the public comment period uh, through September 9th. Oh, so the comment period ended on September 9th. So we expect those um, to be adopted soon. And we have reviewed them and they seem to be in compliance with the law. So uh, we should expect those. They knew they had an October 1st deadline. Are they gonna make that? I don't know, but there's been no final action on those regs, but the forms are available. Uh, I think it was at least at the Maryland register site, but if not on the department's website. Um, I saw working. a question about um, asking more about the tenants first right of refusal law. Um, if you go in our chat, it was posted at the very beginning, a link to, uh, we have a FAQ um, explanation of the new tenant first right of refusal law, which really breaks it down. Um, it's very clear, great resource to look at. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's get through the rest and then uh, we'll clean up any outstanding questions. Do we have anything left? Uh, yeah, VA financing addendum. Um, previously, there was confusion of the buyer's options when the certificate of reasonable value uh, was less than the amount of the contract price. We've added language to clarify that the buyer has five days to either one, take no action, which will result in the contract becoming null and void at the end of the five day period, two, notify the seller that they agree to move forward with the contract at the contract price, or three, negotiate with the seller to lower the contract price. If the parties agree to lower the contract price during the five day period, uh, the buyer covenants and agrees to be bound to proceed with the consummation hereof at the agreed upon contract price. If after negotiations, the seller refuses to lower the contract price, but the buyer still wants to proceed with the contract at the contract price, the buyer must notify the seller in writing of their intention to do so before that five day period expires. Um, and that language is literally what we put into the VA financing addendum. So I don't think we need to pull that out. For time's sake, uh, let's, I'm gonna move forward to the general residential dwelling lease template. Um, so House Bill 139 now requires a landlord to provide a copy of the utility bill to the tenant if the tenant pays the landlord directly for the cost of utilities. Um, I'll, we'll show that change to the lease um, in a second. House Bill 693 now limits the maximum amount for a security deposit to one month's rent. Previously, it was two months rent for the maximum amount of a security deposit. Come October 1st, that will now be one month's rent, the maximum amount. Um, common questions we get asked about that. Uh, the well, What does it apply to? So it does not apply to existing leases. So if you signed a lease last month and that landlord collected two months uh, two months for the security deposit, that landlord come October 1st does not have to refund one month of the two months security deposit. It applies to, to leases that are renewed or brand new leases after October 1st. So if you renew a lease after October 1st or sign a brand new one, the maximum amount of security deposit that can be collected is one month's rent. The other question we get asked is about pet deposits. Pet depo if you're collecting a pet deposit under the eyes of the statute, a pet deposit is the same thing as a security deposit. Um, the definition of a security deposit, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, is money that the landlord collects to protect that landlord from damage to their property. 
So collecting a pet deposit is protecting that landlord from potential damage caused by the pet. That is considered a security deposit. So what does that mean? It means if you charge, if you plan on charging one month for a security deposit plus a $500 pet deposit, that will no longer be allowed because that total amount goes over one month for the security deposit. Um, okay. Yeah, we also made one more change, but I'll just pull it up and we can go through it. Okay. The first change we made was we clarified um, what happens when a lease ends. Or so renewal of lease terms here. Uh, if it's gonna be the end of the initial term, tenant agrees to vacate the property by the last day of the initial term and landlord shall provide tenant with a minimum of 60 days notice to vacate prior to the end of the initial term. Uh, from month to month, we just removed language to make it more clear. This lease shall continue in force from month to month after the expiration of the initial term and either party may terminate the month to month lease at the end of any rental month, provided that written notice of not less than 60 days is given to the other party. And for year to year, uh, the lease will continue in force from year to year after the expiration of the initial term. Either party may terminate this year to year lease at the end of any renewal term, provided that written notice of not less than 90 days, year to year leases are 90 days required, is given to the other party prior to the end of any renewal term. Um, as you will see here, that change in the security deposit used to not exceed two months rent. Now it cannot exceed one month's rent. That same change here, total security deposit, including pet deposit, may not exceed one month's rent. Okay, I, I understand this is an important issue for people. We have said this, I've already typed it four times. <laughs> um, there's still five more questions. Um, people keep talking about a pet deposit, pet fee. None that does not exist. You, everybody keeps wanting to talk about this like it's a thing. It is not a thing. It's a security deposit. And the definition of security deposit includes damage to the property, no matter what the source of the damage to the property, whether it's the tenant or a pet residing um, in the property or guests or whomever or whatever. There is no such thing as a pet deposit. It doesn't exist. You want to charge, you could, and the Maryland law now says as of October 1st, you may only collect one month security deposit. End of the story. There is the questions keep coming in first and last month's rent and a month security deposit. That's up to you and your lawyer. We have not made any. I, I, actually, the, the statute does define, does include last month's rent as a security deposit. Okay, so the answer is yep. no. You can include right. the first month's rent and one month security deposit. Yeah. If you guys want to look into um, if you want to charge, you know, you need to check with your lawyer because we also have people saying, well, what if I charge another, you know, a higher amount of monthly rent to a tenant who has a pet? Now, until pet now, there's, so there's now that people with, uh, emotional support animals, things like that, are protected class, the answer would be no, because that would be illegal discrimination. So this is an area that is still kind of in flux at this point. And we may revise our answers over the next year or so. But for now, please don't ask any more questions like, can it be a pet fee? No, I'm I'm done answering these questions. The answers 
No, you can't make up things. You can't call something something else and then say it's okay. No. Can you charge a larger rental amount? Maybe, unless you're running afoul of the discrimination of, uh, it, by discriminating against people with uh, support animals or service animals, I should say, that are now protected class. So you need to tread very, very lightly about on, on this issue. Okay. Um, and this is the, the last change here because of that utility law. So now we've added, um, we've kind of made it easier for the landlord and tenant to identify, is the landlord going to pay this utility? Is a tenant going to pay the utility provider directly for the utility? Or is a landlord going to pay that cost and the tenant going to reimburse the, land, reimburse the landlord for the cost? But for that new law, the requirement down here, if tenant pays the cost of utilities for water, sewer, gas, or electric directly to the landlord, then the landlord has to provide a copy of that utility bill to the tenant. Okay. Now here's Any a good question, question. That, that, is that last... I'm not sure, um, uh, Taylor, and I don't know that you and I have talked about this, is it's on lease renewals. So if I mm -hmm. collected two months in the past and the property and the lease is up for renewal, and it's not most of most of us, I think, most of our property management people, the, the ones that I have talked to, usually say it, I'm sorry, excuse me. Usually um, it's an addendum to the existing lease that just extends the, the term. My, I'm tending to think that that's not a new lease and that they can they don't have to refund the extra month. But I don't know what is your, you have any thought on that or do we need to do we need to mull on that a little bit before we give a so definitive I, answer? I, yeah, I think we we should sit down and, and talk about yeah. it a little further. Okay. Um, I can go we... either way on that. Um, somebody, you know, a, a very good uh, friend of ours and very very active property manager. The way it was explained to me, I'm. Kind of up in the air. Um, I can kind of see it going both ways. I think we're going to have to sit down in uh, the legal department and come up with a definitive answer. But certainly, um, we will we will get to you as soon as we have that. So one month security deposit retroactive. That's the question. Yeah. So we're not really. No, it's not retroactive. But I think as far as if the lease is in effect. October 1st, and you have two months, you don't need to refund it, right? We're not saying that. It's lease is entered into after October 1st. Right. So the question is, would the law come into effect on the renewal of an existing lease? Does that qualify as a new lease after October 1st, requiring the landlord to refund one of those months with interest, of course? I think that's an open question. I don't want to answer it today. I think the legal department will send out something soon with a def more definitive answer. So no refunds on renewals. We're not at, we're not saying yes or no to that, uh, Lisa. We're just we're going to say, stay tuned. Yeah, <laughs> we have some work to do on that. And it's part because the statute does not really address renewals. It just says leases. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the question uh -huh. is: it renewal or lease, or is it just a renewal of an existing right. lease? Yeah, we could check with the department too to see what they th what they think. And this is for residential only, yes. Yes. Yeah. So some of these. Some of these questions are, you know, very fact specific. Um, yeah. I would recommend reaching out. <laughs> I would recommend reaching out to our legal hotline um, so we can, you know, sit down and talk to you over the phone, or you know, commit a lot of time to to looking into your question.
Well, we've gone over the initial hour, so we still have uh, most people still here. So questions that we did not get to. And if we didn't and it was earlier and we didn't feel free to repost it. So it comes to the top of our list. I'm going to go, Taylor, I'm going to go to the top and come down. Okay. You can go from the bottom up and see if there's any. Okay. Chris Alcorn, is a contract accepted after 10? Oh, well, yeah, um, Chris, re, re, I'm not sure what that responds, what that corresponds to. So, and say that again. Um, will this... Here's, I mean, so going back to super funds, a realtor would have to have a general knowledge of the location of super fund sites to know which sellers to notify of this or else make all sellers go through this process question. So Dean, yeah, that's the right answer is the, the latter. So again, as Taylor went through the listing agreement and the super fund site provision of the listing agreement, yeah, I would suggest unfortunately, and this is what the General Assembly does. Look, this is our complaint, again, with the General Assembly that keeps giving people all of these new responsibilities and, and us trying to help consumers comply with these laws. And I mentioned the law of diminishing returns early on. This is a perfectly good example. The answer is yes. Apparently, the General Assembly is okay making all sellers go to the website Draw a circle. There's a tool where you can say, and 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 somebody asked for it. Um, Krista had it, and, and we'll make that readily available. And it's a tool. It's a mapping tool, where you put in your location and you say within a mile, and it draws a circle for you, and then notifies you if there is a Superfund site within that mile radius. So Check yes. That. I put that in the chat as well. Outstanding, Kelly. Thank that you. Map. So oh. that is a very robust, I've seen it work. It's a very robust mapping tool. That you can point the sellers to and say, put your address in or put the address, you know, put your address in if you're the seller, um, pick a mile and it will draw a circle. And if your property or any part, is that right, Taylor? It doesn't have to be the whole super fun. It could just, as long yes. as it touches on the site because these are you know irregularly shaped parcels but we're relying on the epa's mapping and uh you know look we're not happy about this either guys so don't sorry um we do our best to make these not as bad as they could have been and this one is a perfect example but every time people have a bad experience with the transaction they run to their delegate or senator, and the next thing you know, every single transaction in Maryland, tens of thousands of transactions are affected because a couple of people had a bad experience. And it's a fight we fight every year. And I tell you what, pretty much half of our contract is nothing but this. And it's and it's it's kind of crap. And it's it and I'm not sure, you know, that it helps anybody, to be very honest with you. I'm just not sure. So you know, again, this is what we fight. Um, this is what our advocacy does. A lot of them we win, but a lot of times, you know, it's it's hard to convince them uh, once they hear these horror stories. <laughs> um, and at some point, we just have to back off. So somebody talked about a um, an example of a Superfund site. Yeah, there are plenty of them. How many are there in, in Maryland? I, uh, I think Kristen it's like a little, little less than 20. Something like that. I thought it was 26. Um, yeah, was something like that. 26. 26, yeah. A little between 20 and 30, yeah. Um, so there was a very high profile example in uh, Baltimore, Harbor East. There, One of the uh, big hotels is constructed on what was a chromium dump back in the very early days of the Inner Harbor when they were dumping toxic chemicals at this site where there was a, a some kind of a, a manufacturing plant that utilized chromium in the manufacturing process. And they just dumped barrels and barrels 
of spent chromium in on this on this site and that was cleaned up it took years and years to clean it up and then they had to put this really thick plastic liner in this enormous hole in the ground and then they were able to build uh, the new hotel on that site so there are many many examples uh thanks barb maloney 26 just the, kelly was right um and you could always just count on barb for coming through thanks barb so um yeah there are many many examples of superfund sites i would tell you uh fort dietrich in maryland is one um almost every military installation is one <laughs> mm -hmm. um for whatever reason i'm sure fort meade is don't quote me i'm i'm almost positive fort meade is one uh, I know for a fact Fort Detrick is one. Uh, and so there are many other manufacturing sites and military installations that that are super fun sites. But just search it. I mean, just Maryland super fun sites. The question oh, from Jim Blaney, thanks. Jim, haven't seen you in a long time. How you doing? Um, good link. Let me look. Cleanups in my community. Great. Jim Blaney put in a uh, site. It's a little slow coming up, but yeah, there you go. Perfect. Many, many ways to find this. Use, use, use the internet, my friends. <laughs> Question here. Isn't water quality test considered environmental test, which is on the contingency list on the release form? So yes, I believe it is. Um, so we have home or environmental inspections. So I, Chuck, you can disagree with me, but I, I think a, an inspection of the well would be considered an environmental inspection. Yes. So, so yes, if a buyer does terminate um, pursuant to the water quality test addendum, then it would fall under the, the list of contingencies. <clears throat> Can you redress an unsolicited offer received on rentals as it pertains to the right of first refusal? Well, let's go back to the right of first offer, the, the, the exclusive negotiating period. Um, if it's from the tenant, I assume, this is Lisa, I assume that the unsolicited offer received by the landlord from the tenant in that case, I would suggest that it's so, only subject to the exclusive negotiating period per the landlord's disclosure to the tenant of the solicitation of the offer form that's going to be coming out from the department. Does that make sense, Taylor? Yeah, so so this is our um, summary of that new tenant first right of refusal process. So we have down here the unsolicited unsolicited offer. Uh, the landlord receives that unsolicited offer from a third party. The landlord will provide a notice to the tenant and the Office of Landlord and Tenant Affairs of their right of first refusal. The tenant has that 30-day window to deliver an offer at the same sales price as the third party. If the tenant delivers an offer at the same sales price, the landlord shall accept the offer um, and the landlord notifies the office of landlord and tenant affairs, whether the tenant exercised the rights offered under the process. Yeah, and I don't think it's covered because, um, you know, the, the, the unsolicited offer won't have access to the terms and conditions on which the uh, the landlord is soliciting the offer, right? So I would not consider an unsolicited offer to be covered under the statute as written. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um... Now that's from a third party, that's different. Unsolicited offers from third parties are different than from the tenant, is that right? Yeah. So would the Superfund site disclosure be included on environmental? No. The, the environmental is a home or environmental inspection. 
the super the existence of the Superfund site is not going to fall under that category. Post the TOPA summary. I think you did. Yeah, that's in the yeah. chart. The summary that I just pulled yeah. up right here right. is in the chat. And there's a lot of there's a lot of information on the Department of Housing and Community Development website. Yeah, they have their own FAQ. So ours here is pretty boiled down um, and straightforward. Theirs is, I think it's like four or five pages long, um, goes over a lot of different FAQs. Yeah. So that's another good resource. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's also a, a clarification. If you go to the Superfund location site, you put in the your the seller's property address, not the address of what a super fun site that you may or may not have even knowledge of. So that's a good clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're losing people slowly, but um, if there's any. Yeah, so Jessica, that's a very good question. Um, and 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 frankly, you, you hit the nail on the head because the Frederick County noticed the buyers that, yeah, buyers go look at this link because those that bill, if I'm not mistaken, that was the sinkhole disclosure bill. That's one of our other strategies. So when when somebody comes and wants this certain disclosure, it is almost always a statewide disclosure for every seller or every buyer in the tens of thousands of transactions a year. And then when we dig down deeper, when we get the actual backstory, it turns out, well, yeah, there was this one time, this one deal, this one transaction. And yeah, I'm not making light of the impact of that on a buyer, especially without knowledge of these things. So please don't get me wrong. But I will say that we try, the very thing, first thing we try to do is, is isolate the, the problem. And if the problem, in fact, involves a single county, we will, we will work like heck to make that apl applicable in a single county. We will also help with, if, for example, military installations, there was a, there's that, that crazy notice about military installations. That was basically from Pax River in Southern Maryland because of the jets. So it was like, okay, if you live near a uh, military installation, you should be aware that, you know what, it could be loud. <laughs> so the, the our first uh, piece of advocacy is understanding how big the problem is. Second of all, trying to make sure that the solution proposed by the General Assembly is in proportion to the issue they are trying to address. This concept of proportionality is a really big deal for us. And so we will not make any disclosure or any requirement, whether it's a, a test or any kind of uh, you know, disclosure applicable across the state for a problem that has a, of a very limited and narrow scope. So we constantly talk about the proportionality of the proposed solution as it relates to the issue problem, quote unquote, being addressed. And so that that was actually a good question, Jessica. More of an observation, I guess, not Somebody a Somebody asked for the, uh, the URL to the tenant's first right of refusal bill. We're going to be putting that in the chat. Kelly, I don't know if you saw, um, I put that in our chat. Um, we'll share that in the chat for everybody. Yep, I'll grab it. Thanks. Yeah, and that includes, uh, Sheila, a question, the answer to your question about if the landlord has an unsolicited offer, what the tenant's rights are under those circumstances. Is that right? Okay. 
looks like we're dropping off a decent amount of people. <clears throat> yeah, well, I think uh, 90 minutes, I think we can wrap it up. Um... Just, just some things to note, you know, if you guys, like I said, if you have a, a complex question or if you still have lingering questions after today, please feel free to reach out to our legal hotline. Um, one of our attorneys will get back to you. Um, this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within a day or two, the recording and all of these forms and the manual of changes and practice tips are on our website as well. Stop my yeah. share. All righty. Thank you, okay. everyone. Thanks, everybody. If we didn't get to your question or there's one that we did not answer, apparently, sorry, Sheila, um, give us a call and we'll address your problem or your question one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.